field of translated training and education can be divided into two main questions that have to be dealt with. One is, what do we want to teach and learn? And the second is, how do we teach and learn it? The how is dealt with fairly well by education science these days. You can go and take a course in how to teach, how to design a course, how to design a program. Uh, and quite a lot of research is done on that. The interest for us, though, is that the what, which is for us translation here, also interpreting, but I'll try to focus on translation, the what is intimately related with the how. Translation is not just a, a neutral matter that can be taught in the same way as we might teach mathematics or uh, how to write in English. And I hope to explain that in a minute. Putting the two together might explain why this is a tremendously difficult field to work in or to do research on. Translating, you hope, I hope you know by now, has got numerous variables around it. It's not just a, a question of the source text and you trying to imitate it. There are many, many other variables involved. And it's a, a complex cognitive operation and a complex social operation as well. With a certain mystery because of the complexity. It's still a mystery to me. How is it possible to move a message in some way from one language and reproduce it in another? How is that really possible? I don't really know. And that complexity still uh, fascinates me and makes me excited about studying this particular field of activity. Equally fascinating though is learning. How is it that we get from a stage of knowledge and capacity to act and move to the next one? And some people do it very well, some people have a lot of trouble doing it. How is it that the mind is able to learn? Put those two together and you've got a, a really mysterious object of study. Very, very, very complex. I'll try to make some sense of that complexity, inevitably by reducing it. The prime reduction that we have in the literature that's been carried out on this is on the what, and the what we are going to teach. And people these days just say, we're going to teach you translation, or how to translate. Uh, they tend to divide it up. Uh, translating, the act of translating, involves a set of skills. The skills are knowing how to do something. You also have to have knowledge. Knowledge of what translation memory is available, knowledge of what not to do, knowledge of how much you can charge, knowledge of the source language, knowledge of the target language, knowledge of the material that you're translating, lots and lots of knowledge. And that's knowing that. Okay, the knowing how and the knowing that are really quite separate. And then uh, the third thing that you're supposed to get out of education, we'll say, is, uh, is has various names, but often attitudes. That is, we're supposed to make you, oh, any number of things, aware of current events, aware of your position in the world, interested in all kinds of fields of knowledge. You're supposed to be trustworthy, reliable, punctual, all these things. You're supposed to get from education as well. We would call those attitudes. Sometimes they're the most interesting. They, they, the idea goes back to the classical uh, Greek-Roman notion of virtues. You're supposed to be trained to live an ethical life. And an ethical life is a life that exercises the virtues. A little bit of, is in that. Put those three together and you have the notion of competence. Sometimes called competency and I don't make a distinction between the two. When people talk about what we, we're training you in, often they say translation competence. And competence means skills, knowledge, attitudes. Those three things together. You see, it's become a lot more than just how to translate. There's a lot more involved there. 
I think that that, I, I'm very wary about that term competence. I'm explaining it as an orthodoxy that's out there in the field and motivating all the research. Often, I suggest, um, we have short-term training programs. Short-term can mean a weekend to three weeks to six months, perhaps a year. Okay? And I think when you get that sort of training, you're really being trained in skills. How to. Yeah. Knowing how to do something. If you're involved in a longer term, you know, in Europe we have four, five-year programs, BAMA in translation. So somebody can go to university and study translation for five years, and longer if they want to add on other kinds of masters. Uh, there, you're going to be trained in everything. You're going to get the skills, but you would want to get a lot of knowledge as well, and the attitudes would have to be developed. We would want to see that, you know, students come in at 18 and leave at 23. We expect to see character development and things happening over that period as well. Uh, Don Kirali introduced a distinction. He distinguished between translator training, which is focusing on the skills okay, that you need in order to do a job. To complete a task, you need these skills. Uh, as opposed to education, which is developing the whole person as a person who has the skills, knowledge and attitudes sufficient to enter a professional community. And so the competence will be a long-term program, uh, program training you to enter the community of professional interpreters. Don Corelli um, is an American who uh, works at uh, Germersheim at the University of Mainz in, in Germany. And he's done a lot over the years to conceptualize uh, new ways of training translators, although he would tend to put it as education. In the university he works in has a long-term program of five years or four and a half years, uh, and uh, they do aim to train the whole individual as a translator with all those elements. Corelli distinguishes interest in a very interesting way, and you'll see why in a minute, between two ways of doing things in the classroom. Okay, this is how you teach that. The traditional model is to do what I'm doing now. Teacher at the front, student sitting around, teacher speaks, all this wonderful knowledge goes through the teacher, teacher's mind, mouth, through the airways, through your ears, and, and I'm pouring knowledge into your brain. From my brain to your brain. <laughs> This is called a transmissionist model, because we are transmitting knowledge. Okay? This was prior to photocopy machines, uh, internet, uh, uh, mass book production. Knowledge has traditionally been transmitted through one person speaking to many. It's quite efficient at transmitting knowledge, although it has been outdone by electronic communication technologies, if you think about it. Kirelli posits that that is the traditional way in which translation is taught. And he might be right in the particular country he's working in. I don't know if it's right for you. Okay. Personally, when I went to primary school, we didn't have tr transmissionist teaching. I don't know if I was in a particularly enlightened country in Australia in the 1960s, if you can remember. You can't remember. Imagine. You know, when we went into the school, in primary school, we had groups, our tables were together, the teacher would give us activities, we had to work as groups on the activities, and if there's a problem, the teacher gives a short talk to the whole lot, but the teacher's role was to go around and check on what each group is doing. And I've had that for my whole life. Uh, so that's sort of normal for me, but not normal for um, other cultures, I'm told. Uh, Corelli would call that sort of teaching constructivist in the sense, and, and you can see it, it's based on project work, group project work, experimental work. Instead of the instructor telling you what knowledge is, you have to find it yourself. 
through doing things, through activities. Uh, you can have role playing. You can, by practicum class, we just did a whole role playing activity where half the class were clients, client companies, the other class were translation companies, and the Chinese translation companies had to sell a Chinese translation to clients who know nothing about Chinese. This is a real world situation, but simple role playing. Uh, and rather than knowledge being a fixed quantity that is transmitted, it's more like a collective, a shared discovery process. Let's see what happens. Let's see what we can find. Okay? That would be the constructivist model. And for Corrali, those are two quite separate things. Usually when people set up that sort of binary opposition, there's a good guy and a bad guy. I guess you can imagine which is the goodie and which is the bad. Here's a, a model of the different kinds of activities that, that can be done within a constructive assembly. Uh, in the middle, uh, Corrali says we should all be working on authentic collaborative translation projects. What does this mean? Authentic means it should be from the real world, not a pedagogical example that we've selected just for that particular class. And, that the, the instructor has, has invented or has uh, manipulated in some way. It should be authentic. Collaborative means you're going to work together on it. It's not just each individual working together. Since teamwork is a feature of the, co the community we're supposed to be training you for. And, and projects means it's not just a text. It's a text plus instructions. Uh, perhaps with instructions about what kind of terminology to use, it might come with a glossary, it might come with a profile of the client, it might come with the, the, the uh, an instruction about the goal to be attained. We want to sell this to these particular uh, market segments, for example. Around that, there's a whole lot of different things that can be done. I bet you can't see it, but I'll try to explain them as we go. Okay. Uh, for example, you can do, I'll start down here, uh, translation without an assignment. It's possible just to give you the text to translate. But up here, you can have all sorts of uh, translation with an assignment, translation with a different kind of scopos or a different set of instructions. We can do that. Or we can give you half a translation and you finish the rest. So you're going to be looking back and trying to pick up on the strategies and the end, the the terminology that's been, been used. Um, we can give you a bad translation and get you to improve it, as is post-editing. Uh, it can come in as well. Okay. Uh, parallel translation would mean that different people are doing translations of the same text, and at the end of the exercise you're going to compare and hopefully debate and discuss the differences, uh, rather than them doing it all together. Okay. Uh, partial translation, no need to do the whole text. We might want to focus on some particular aspects of it. And we can do things like multiple choice translation. We can give you a text with gaps in it. You know, part of it's translated. And here you've got to pick the right way, uh, the right term that, that, that's there. Uh, paraphrase translation. We can get you to do live research on internet search and to just do that documentation as a separate activity. Uh, mining parallel texts, that is, a target text on the same subject, uh, get the terminology and phraseology from that text prior to doing your translation. Okay. Um, you've got editing and proofreading, you've got the uh, analysis, a bit of marketing prior to do the, doing the translation. You can get people to go out and see what else has been done in that field. Uh, by similar companies or for similar products, uh, for example. Okay, uh, a whole range of different activities can be done if you move from that transmissionist model to the constructivist model. And there are many more there. I think it's interesting if you just spent 18 months just translating texts to think of all the other things that could be done uh, to make the learning experience more varied. Corelli's model is really one that um, 
takes you from the position of, of novice through to apprentice to journeyman, doesn't sound very good, near professional, we would say. And then when you graduate, uh, you're supposed to have expertise and be able to enter the community of professionals. The idea is that you start off doing authentic projects. This um, raises your awareness of things you weren't, you haven't thought about before, is what usually happens. In fact, what usually happens is, if you start off here with very little um, expertise and, and uh, confront an authentic project, um, beginners assume that if something is in ST, then there must be something in TT corresponding to it, and translation is very literal at the beginning. Okay? And then you make people aware of the wider context, the wider effects that texts are supposed to have, and this is where the consciousness raising comes in. Okay? In my experience, what happens is, after about, hmm, what, two months, one month for some, they think, oh, you mean I don't have to say what's in the source text? And they go off and invent these most wonderful translations that are not translations, these new texts and add in things because they sound better. So, and, and then, uh, after about six months, six, I have to pull them down back to earth. Hey, there's a text over here, you know, there's a client <laughs> over here, let's get back on track with a bit of realism. Okay. Uh, the model is, is one of scaffolding that you make the tasks easier at the beginning, you give lots of instructions, you give lots of advice, lots of gu guidelines, the same way as you build a building with all the scaffolding. And once the building is in place, the scaffolding is taken away. So little by little, the presence of the instructor, the intervention of the instructor, the reliance on the instructor, should disappear. So that from about, if you're doing a two-year course, from here to the end, suddenly you should be doing it all by yourself and evaluating yourself probably between them. Uh, and, and the presence of the instructor should uh, diminish to the point where you, where you need no instructor. This would be the stage of self-reliance with experience because you've gained experience through the training process and you've gained expertise. I'm not going to go into the theory of expertise here. Um, except just to say the, the main element of, of expertise in this model is that you grasp a wider whole. You're not hung up on the small bits and pieces as you would at the beginning down here with phrases and, and sentences and uh, dictionary equivalents bothering you. The stage of expertise is you can see the whole text, you can see text plus the client, you can make decisions very efficiently. Um, bearing in mind a multiplicity of factors. And that comes very much through doing it, through experience. So much for Kirali's model of what he terms empowerment. At the beginning, the teacher has the power and the student has none. At the big end of the training program or education program here, the student, the learner, has been empowered. The beauty of Kirali, and this is really why I'm spending so long with him, is that he does manage to put these two bits together. The how, the what, that is translation, together with the how, how we teach. Uh, Kirali posits that traditional thinking about translation is transmissionist. That just as the transmissionist teaching model takes knowledge from the instructor to you, the passive receptacles of knowledge, so the classical traditional model of translation takes knowledge from the source text and transmits it to the passive receiver. Okay? So, in the double transmissionist model, the teacher or the instructor is the expert, or the source text is king, as Vermeer you said in his metaphor information from one side to the other, and one side is very passive. 